Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fourth installment of Artist Conversations with Melton Gallery. Joining me this week is uh, Sean Beeks and Timmy. Hello. Um, both artists living and working in Philadelphia and also both small business owners. I started drawing in elementary school, favoring realism and skateboard graphics at the age of 12. I majored in drawing and painting at the University of Georgia, graduating in 1999 and continuing my education at the University of the Arts in 2006, earning a master's in painting. Since 1996, I've worked as an illustrator for various skateboard companies and skate shops, using skateboards as an affordable vehicle for my art. My work is a visual representation of all things I can't say at work. Due to the light paint application and detail of my work, my drawings and paintings are best viewed in person. However, illustrations can easily be seen on Instagram at slapstick skateboard art. I'm originally from West Texas, but live in Philadelphia. I'm an artist, designer, and master printer in Philadelphia. I received my MFA from Cranbrook Academy of Art. I regularly teach at Penland School of Craft and Tyler School of Art. Recent exhibitions include Pentimenti Gallery, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Delaware Art Museum at the Delaware Center for Contemporary Art in Wilmington, Delaware. I have several works in public and private collections. So uh, welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time out. Um, so I wanted to start with you, Sean. I wanted to start with a studio tour. If could show us a little bit about what your workspace is like and how you make work. Okay. So this is just going to be a general view of where I work. I have always had a studio at home just because I don't like traveling whenever I get an idea. I want to be able to just get up and do it. No. Um, and since since moving to Philadelphia, uh, I have switched from larger pieces to significantly smaller pieces of work just because they don't take up as much space. And I ran out of room while I was uh, still living in Atlanta to store a bunch of big paintings. Um, the way that I go about working from home uh, generally starts and either watching a program of news or a film or reading a book just wherever an idea comes from i always carry a small little notebook with me that i will log ideas in um, and these may or may not become drawings um let's see if i can find one there. Um, what tends to happen is I'll get a hold of an image or an idea and I will work out the steps of how to recreate that in a notebook. Um, and then from that point, um, I'll practice uh, color application, uh, figure out really all the all the steps on how I'm going to create that piece. I think on this in this case, I will deal with figuring out which colors of paint to use, um, the layout, and I think you'll be able to see on the screen right now like reference photos. Oh right. Before actually applying it to a piece of wood or canvas or paper. Mm. So a lot of my work is just, it's just as much planning as it is application. Mm -hmm. um, the end result uh, over the years, there've been a lot of skateboard graphics that I've uh, created with other artists. Um, running a skateboard company is probably going to be the main thing that really got me to focus on all the planning and production because there are uh, retail spaces like wholesale accounts and private um, 
individual buyers that are relying on me to get something out at a certain certain date. Right. So I've got to deal with all of that before I even start. That's how I make stuff. Have you found difficulty in staying organized when you work collaboratively on your skate deck and skateboard deck? Yeah. <laughs> um, not everyone is that organized. Uh, and I have had to I've had some difficulties in the past in working with like artists that are really good at um, making the images, but they're not very good with organization or deadlines. Um, just really just unreliable. So, and I've even had that issue with like manufacturers. So I've had to essentially just tell people the wrong date so that they would get the stuff to me on time. I think a lot of it just depends on, a lot of it depends on the environments that you're in, specifically like the environment that you grow up in. Cause mm -hmm. like both of my parents are incredibly organized. So I know that had a lot to do with it. Um, um. You can learn it, but it gets a lot harder the older you get because you're already set in your ways of just doing what you want when you want to do it. Yeah, dealing with other people's personality. I feel like I'm a pretty organized person and I have maybe higher expectations than what a typical artist, that kind of, you know, stereotypical artist would have. And so, you know, I, I do have the same thing as Sean. It's like I have an expectation of how things are supposed to go how the project is supposed to go, timelines, you know, all this sort of thing. And the same thing, it's like you realize over time that the deadline isn't really a deadline. That's, you know, my deadline is not your deadline. And I don't necessarily, I mean, artists get a bad reputation for this. Um, I think it, it goes across all crafts and mediums and all you know all walks of life you two have a really unique perspective on the realities of needing to produce things um at a certain time to live <laughs> you know um what it the realities of what it's like to make art um as a means of financially kind of supporting you is very different than the way some other people have an art practice. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, your business, your businessmen get a different yeah, idea. It's but, like this. The yeah. irony, though, is that that's the, the at least for me, um, it opens up, it, it, it actually opens up opportunities for me creatively because I, I do have this like very strict way of like, I'm obsessed about efficiency. And, and I think because of that and many other things, it's like, it actually opens up all these other opportunities for, because galleries or people that are paying you money, um, whether it be like customers or stores or whatever it is, if they see a reliable source if they see as you you as someone who if they can give you money and you're going to produce what you say you're going to produce or they put you in a group show and you show up and you have what you said you were going to show up with and then you get a solo show and you get stores with, that do wholesale you get you know if you have a, a customer that comes to you and buys something and you deliver on that product what you say you are going to deliver on then they're going to come back yeah yeah it's really you're going to get a second happen. show you're going to get you know it leads to other things so it is this kind of like irony in that you you kind of like are maybe a little bit more rigid in the way that you frame your 
your practice of either business or art or creativity. Um, but the reality is that that actually causes your your life to flourish rather than be boxed in by these things that you believe are real. I've seen it over and over again. I've worked with so many people who can't meet basic deadlines or can't fulfill what they say they're going to fulfill. And it's like they're not successful because of those like very basic things. All right, Tim, you ready to show us your workspace? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the magical, magical land of chimneys. There it is. Look at that. Look at all that stuff. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, well, this is work and business. So, well, first, I should just say safety first. There's some... <laughs> Of fire extinguishers there don't forget to buy your fire extinguishers <laughs> um well i do a lot of things i mean sewing so i have uh seven industrial sewing machines so that's kind of like a part of my life um under this giant pile of fabric is a uh, filter an industrial filter which i can show you there's there's some like stuff so this is also kind of reality is that I shoot so much video and do photos that I have kind of permanently mounted, you know, uh, photographic lights and I have a like camera and mic situation so I can, you know, constantly like if I need to, I can just like put something down on the table and do that. Um, these are tufting looms. I have three. And this is like a wall of random yarn. So basically, well, talking about tufting is like, like pretty complicated, but essentially it's also uh, interesting because my work actually starts on the computer as well. But basically I start all my wall tapestries on, in Illustrator as well. Um, and then those get projected onto these uh you know, these looms and this is just fabric that's like stretched over the the loom itself and then it gets tufted from from behind so this is the back of the the piece here and those aren't mine um but you can see so even these are kind of projected onto the the loom and then those are tufted from behind so this is what more like what it would look like from the front and i mean the end of the day they're just like fancy carpets or rugs but you know they i try to create designs that are more interesting than you know what would typically obviously what you would find in like a carpet store so this was a jamaican church and my daily life right now which we'll probably get into is completely insane <laughs> uh, so my business is taking over my life right now so hence all of the the chaos but i can also show you the basement do you want to see the basement i don't know yeah yeah well and i have a wood shop too but i don't know if you want to see the wood shop. <clears throat> okay so this is going back into the this is like so oh so that giant table can be used for screen printing it's a seven yard screen print table um so there's like giant screens so this is the screen washout station this is a different section for checking materials and packing and then we have yarn so this is all yarn that i sell but i can also use so this is all stuff and then going back into this space <laughs> is mostly more yarn so there's about a thousand pounds of yarn in here and then we get another 500 tomorrow so i have three industrial yarn coners so basically we take this yarn that's on big cones we put it on that machine we wind it off on just small cones like that and we sell it 
generally, and this has been my whole life, I don't, I've never been someone to work past like six o'clock and on the weekends. Like I, I mean, the, the tufting business is my job. And so I treat it as my job, even if it's like right now, it's super, super crazy busy, but I still, I know from, you know, I don't know, life that it doesn't help to just continue thinking about that. Like it, it actually makes me a better, better at my job to shut it off, you know, not think about it. And if it means like doing creative things at the, at night or on the weekends, then, then that's fine. But also like if I'm say preparing for a show that I can use because I work for myself and I'm sure Sean's the same way. It's like, I can use the daytime to work on my own work if I need to. I stopped working, I think in uh, late November uh, before like all of, like the unemployment of everyone hit. So I've had a lot of time to adjust just to focusing on my artwork at home. Um, and I, I took a long break from uh, producing skateboards. Um, I had actually had, had plans to just stop making them because the industry had changed so much and what I was doing is not what kids wanted. Hmm. And I really didn't want to make what kids wanted. What so. do you want? Oh. Um, logos, um, a lot of branding. Brand names, like, um, I don't know. But the only skate brands I know are from the 90s. And I don't even know if they're it's. It, it looks a lot like NASCAR. Whoa, that's really fascinating. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> it gets, it's really disgusting to me. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah. Or eventually, like, I have you ever, now we're somewhere else, but have you guys ever seen um, speed walking in the Olympics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They're shorts. Their little baby shorts have um, like Colorado <laughs> logos on them. <laughs> they got you to look at the shorts. So they uh, want those. You don't. You can't give them the logos. No, because it's always been some kind of social commentary or like a some. Some weird art project that ends up on a board. Yeah. Um, and then when I started having other artists uh, contracting the work out to other artists, um, I always encourage them to to really just do put the work on the board that represented their fine art practice and not what the industry wanted. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's just a niche market that just keeps getting smaller. So what made it sustainable? How are you able to continue to do it? Um, being very selective with the shops that I had accounts with. Um, and a lot of that stemmed from building a relationship with them just as a customer or just a person passing through. Um, in most cases, like before, it, it would take months before they even knew that I ran a board company because I just wanted to see what they were like as a person, as people, mm. before dealing with them to get a better idea whether or not they were going to be, not even like whether or not they were going to be like a, a good account to have, but just whether or not they were good people. Yeah, I mean, um, since you're entering into a relationship with them. Yeah. Um, so that's, and like, th this is also kind of related to what Tim was saying earlier, where uh, with the, like your relationship with a gallery, if you meet deadlines and you show that you're responsible, you're going to get rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. that's that's really how I've been able to sustain the accounts that I've had over so many years. Neither of you are in the position to be able to just stop doing what you have to do. Um, and I'm sure quarantine has affected the way that you make your work in some way. So I'd like to start with you, Sean, if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, basically it's, it's, it's caused me to just shift where my attention is going uh, and what I'm making. Um, I have more time, or I'm just devoting more time to the fine art and commission work. I wanted to learn a new way of doing things. So now it's like made, made a transition to just working more. It's an abstract approach to representational work. Working with just ink and water, there's really, there's no way to really to absolutely control what it's going to do. Oh, I see. Uh, really just depending on how you apply it to the paper is like, if you just put like a, a blot of water in a drop of ink in it, you can't control what the initial, initial reaction is going to be. So yeah. given that, and given like the way that I just naturally make work, I then try to make something out of the mess yeah. that's given to me. So taking the control, some of the control out of it. Yeah. And like doing that more and more over like the past two or three months is like I've kind of figured out a way to almost control the mess or manipulate the mess. Ooh, that's symbolic if ever I heard it. <laughs> 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 it's right now. I mean, <laughs> great. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting because I my business provides products for artists and people being creative. So as a consequence, my business is like just been super crazy busy. So like I'm I feel good about the fact that I'm shipping this stuff all over the world for people who are stuck at home, creative people who are stuck at home. You know, I think for my own personal thing is like, I'm just maybe in survival mode, I guess, like just trying to do what I can do to survive and make sure that I have, you know, I can pay my bills and I can like really take care of what, cause I don't know how long this is going to last. Um, and it's worked out really well. It's just, I feel overworked because I don't, you know, it's like normally I have people helping do the work, but because they're not coming in, it's like I'm doing the work of several people. It's like I'm pouring out everything. I'm like spending all day filling orders and sending people yarn and sending people tufting guns and like doing all this. And I'm just like totally fried I can't think about anything else like the end of the day, you know, and, you know, it's, it's like, that's fine. Like in a way that's fine because I'm surviving, but I'm also helping a lot of people. So I don't feel necessarily bad about it. I don't know if I could sustain that for ever, but <laughs> um, not at all, but it it's, it's okay right now. Like I can't complain because I have a lot of friends that are either going out of business or don't have jobs and can't pay their bills. And I don't have that problem at all. I have an opposite problem. I think we're all just trying to process and deal with it in a way that we can do right now, you know? Mm -hmm. So. Cause you're the guy facilitating other people's, uh, artistic experimentation like tufting is the yeah. new medium that people are trying out and um you know they're they're finding new ways of making through you so that's kind of yeah. an interesting through line yeah connecting thread if you will 
how has the idea of success changed or how has your rubric of what is success changed? Okay. Um, there were there were years where I felt like success, success was going to be really living up to someone else's standard. Um, like at some point in your life, get married, get a career, get a job, um, get a house. Uh, but over time, like after going through art schools and universities and uh, seeing the economy just crash two or three times now in my lifetime, from living this long, like I've, I've been able to refine exactly what it is that makes me happy. Owning a house is not one of them. Uh, passing something on, like kids or something like that, it's just, it's not success to me. At this point in my life, it's really just being able to wake up, make something, uh, eat, pay my bills on time, and go to sleep. Really just not die. Mm -hmm. You know, I just want to be able to grow, go to the grocery store and not care about buying, like, the fancy mustard, you know? <laughs> you know, like, I don't want to buy French's mustard. I want to buy, like, the stone ground mustard. Um, but I also want to, I, I love working for myself. And I think it took 30 some odd jobs to, to understand that that was something that was important to me, working for people at all different levels. And I, I think now that that's kind of critical to like my happiness, which I'm s succeeding at that. <laughs> I'm successful at running my own business and kind of being my own boss. And so that there is success there. Um, and so in a way that's like a driving force of, of making this work is like, I know the alternative, if I consider working for myself successful or being successful because I don't like the alternative, then that's a driving force on making this work. Yeah. And that's all kind of in a basic thing that's like mental, emotional health is I think that's if I can somehow succeed at that and make that work, then that's, you know, success. Actually, what your your answer, Tim, actually got me thinking about that, too, was. I think it's all part of a process of figuring out what success means to you. Yeah. Like, yeah. there's no way that I don't I don't believe that either of us would have really appreciated um, our perception of success now if we hadn't gone through uh, trying on other people's ideas of success. Yeah, right. So it has to be a trial and error thing. You have to figure it out for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think I have any other questions. I don't know. I, this was a pretty good conversation. Yeah. All right. I, I agree. Um, thank you to uh, Tim and John for um, joining me for Melton Gallery's Artist Conversations. I, again, appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me. Um, if anyone has any questions for either artist, please feel free to email me at the gallery, meltongallery at uco.edu, or you can DM me on Instagram at UCO Melton Gallery. Um, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>